And throughout this series, you may have noticed that a lot of them kind of followed the same sort of style of artwork, partly because uh, I'm not that creative, and once I get an idea, then it, you know, <laughs> might as well stick with it if it's working. Uh, so I like this style of, of um, you know, they call it continuous line drawing, where one line is used to do the whole thing. And just so you know, like, I didn't, I didn't draw all those, like, some of them I just borrowed or stole from somewhere or adapted. A couple of them I did, like the scribble, that's all me up there. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, you know, it's, it's, if you follow the line, you can follow the, the one line goes all the way through. So some of you have probably sat there and done that on a Sunday morning, and if you haven't, you're doing it right now. Um, but I like that idea of there being sort of this continuous line, and there sort of has been this continuous line all the way through Acts about the gospel and, and the way it's continually moving forward and, and outward. Um, and this, this particular picture, I was trying to think, okay, uh, what really captures the idea of freedom as, as a visual? And I thought this idea of a, of a bird leaving its cage really felt like, like freedom. But I also, because of it being sort of the continuous line, what I like is you can imagine the bird as it's going further off the page, it's also sort of unraveling and uh, dismantling that cage as it's pulling that, that line. So I thought that's appropriate for the gospel too. So there's my, there's my intro story for, um, for this week. But uh, yeah, thank you. It's not maybe not quite as uh, out there and and uh, unusual as some. But uh, so today we are picking up the story where we left off last time with Paul. Um, they had been shipwrecked. You remember on the island of Malta, as they are on their way to Rome, and uh, they ended up spending the winter there. And then uh, they're picking up the journey again as we move on here. Now, so here's uh, from the final chapter of Acts. Luke is writing, and he says, After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux. This is just a, a little side bit of information that Luke includes that I think is really kind of fascinating. Um, because here, here you have Paul and, and company having just survived this shipwreck. Clearly, clearly God being the one that sustained them. And then he's turning around and he's getting on this boat that is dedicated to these two idols, the Gemini twins, um, who, who were seen as the gods of sailors. Uh, and so all these, all these people on this ship, you know, anxious about their care while well, they're out at sea. And it just, to me, it highlights the fact that the gospel frees us from superstition. Meaning, you know, all these sailors worried about whether or not these gods were going to be happy with them. And, and, and their fate sort of resting on this precarious, uh, sense of, of care by these fickle gods. And, uh, and, and Paul knew better. And, and, um, and not only that, but the fact that he knew who God is meant that he was also free to get on this ship dedicated to these other gods. And it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a scary thing for him to enter into this worldview that was foreign and um, maybe, you know, could, could seem, sometimes it feels like as Christians, we can get intimidated by um, different perspectives out there and, and to realize that we can, we can interact and we can engage in the world and move through it when we're surrounded by this. And we don't have to, we don't have to give it more power than it has because we know, we know the God that's getting us through all the shipwrecks. So, that's just a little side note. That's not really part of where we're going. But so they're on this journey and, and it says, so we came to Rome. 
The brothers and sisters there, the Christians there, had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Apius and the three taverns to meet us. So they're from Rome. Uh, the Forum was on the Apian Way. It was about 40 miles south of Rome, and the three taverns were about 30 miles south. So they were... They, were, they didn't know Paul. They were just excited and wanted to, to welcome him. And so they go out there. And it says, at the sight of these people, Paul thanked God. He was encouraged by their, their coming to meet him. And when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. So kind of a minimum security sort of situation. Three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. And when they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers... Although I've done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of anything deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I've asked to see you and talk with you. It's because of the hope of Israel that I'm bound with this chain. They replied, um, We've not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of our people who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. So here Paul has come all this way to Rome to go on trial before Caesar, and there's, there's no um, evidence of any prosecution formulated. There's no like rumor about a, a, a group coming to, to press their case against him. But these people still are interested because they've heard a little bit about Christianity and want to know what it, what it really is all about. So they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the, the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus, really using Jesus' own technique of walking through the whole Old Testament and showing how it pointed to him. Some were convinced about what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. Paul always has one more thing to say. He said, The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused they hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And that is the, the finale of, of the book of Acts. And uh, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a strange place for Luke to decide to end the story. You know, here, here we've been moving towards Paul having this big trial in Rome. And... Luke stops the story before we actually get to the trial. Um, and the consensus is that Luke wrote this, uh, wrote the book of Acts after Paul had already died. So, so Luke must have known the ending, known what happened, but he doesn't tell us anything about either the trial or uh, Paul's martyrdom or anything like that. And you go, that's... That's interesting. Why would he do that? And I think, I think the answer is because Luke wasn't writing a biography about Paul. Uh, this, this is about the gospel from the beginning. And I kind of like it that he didn't turn it into something different and make it be about Paul and, and about what Paul's, um, you know, Paul's whole experience and even about Paul's 
death because because it really would have been easy to elevate Paul and that's not what what this is about if you remember uh, back at the very beginning of the book of Acts when Jesus was talking to his disciples before he returned to heaven he, he made this statement to them he said but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and, the end, and to the ends of the earth. And, and so you have this sort of ever uh, growing circle outward from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. That's, that's not just a geographical expansion of the gospel. It is also um, the ethnic Expansion. It's going from being just to Israel to being to all the nations. So that's the. This is the story that that Luke is telling, and it's important that the gospel get to Rome. You know, you've all heard the the phrase "all roads lead to Rome," right? And that's <clears throat> that's really not just a metaphor. Um, the The Romans built over two hundred fifty thousand miles of road across their empire. You can see this network of the roads that they built, and you'll notice there how they all converge right there into Rome. Literally, they all do meet in Rome. In fact, if you go to Rome, you can see the base of what was the Golden Milestone, which was the point where all these different roads met. So no matter where you were in the Roman Empire, you could hop on a road and eventually it would take you to Rome. So for the gospel to get to Rome is, in essence, uh, the, the culmination of, of Luke saying, yeah, now the gospel is worldwide, because from there it could spread out um, to everywhere. So, so from Luke's perspective, this is really um, accomplishing where he was trying to get to with his, with his book. Um, but let's, let's go back to those the, the very last sentence of the book there, it says, he proclaimed the kingdom of God. This is talking about Paul. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance, with all this freedom. And, and if, you, if you took that out of the context that we just read it in, that could be talking about Paul in Athens, or someplace where he wasn't being incarcerated, right? Or when he's out just traveling the world, going anywhere. But it's not. It's, it's, it's written about Paul when he's under house arrest, right? He can't leave the yard. He, he has a guard there watching him. And, and this, well, he's house, under house arrest is when he's preaching without hindrance. I just find that so incredible that that's how this is left. That's, that's how this is set up. Because I think if I were in Paul's situation, I'd be, I'd be thinking in terms of beyond this house arrest. I'd be going, okay, well, when I get out of here, then, then here's what I'm going to be able to do. Or I would be going, okay, well, God said I had to get to Rome to, to talk to Caesar. So I'm waiting for Caesar. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this time to prepare for my trial. And I'm going to be thinking, I'm going to be all focused about this one thing that I, that I know that I'm supposed to do. And we don't see that in Paul. We see Paul being very present and very much engaged in life while he is there uh, under house arrest. He's not, he's not checked out or just waiting for the future. It makes me think of what Pete Scazzaro said. He said, maturity in life is when someone is living joyfully within their God-given limits. Because um, Paul, Paul just seems to be living joyfully here. And and I like it also when he, he's calling them the God-given limits, because so often I see these limits as being the barrier to, to me doing what God would have me do, right? You know, the, the thing that's in the way is, is preventing me. And so my question for you today is going, what's your, what's your house arrest? What is the limitation that feels like it is boxing you in right now? Um, 
don't know if anybody has something that they feel uh, so bold as they want to share that's, that they're dealing with right now or struggling with. Owen. Oh, your personality. Yeah, I think that is a really, uh, that's a really true thing. Sometimes just, just our personality can be our limitation. Any, anything else that anybody finds? Thank you for sharing that. Anything else that you, you run into? Maybe it's not something you're dealing with currently, but you found in the past. Anxiety. Anxiety, yep. The circumstances health. of life right now. Yes, our, our, our environment, our culture, our circumstances, health, is that what you said? Okay. Arthritis. Yes, arthritis. I can't even stand in one spot because it's just an agony. So. Yes, yes. So that Physical pain, that's a real limitation. Yeah. I mean, there can be a whole, whole bunch of things, right? Um, Relationships can, can be tough, or lack of relationships, or the job that you're in. Um, grief can be a, a big one. It's hard to, hard to move beyond loss, or, or you just don't have the money to do what you'd like to do. All kinds of things can feel like limitations on us. Um, it kind of along, along the lines of what Owen was saying, I, I think about the, the words from a John Mayer song where he said, I'm bigger than my body gives me credit for. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just feel trapped in yourself. Um, I can sometimes be doing something and, and Karn will say, you're kind of bugging me right now. And, and I'll go, I'm kind of bugging myself right now. You ever feel that like you, you can't stop being you, you can't get away from you, you know, and you're your own limitation. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really true. And all those things can make it feel like we can't be who we're supposed to be. We can't do what we're supposed to do. Uh, and yet... Uh, Second Peter says that his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We, we have it all right here. And uh, the psalm writer said that the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I think sometimes they're very unpleasant places where they've fallen for me. And I wish that I could feel that way more often. Um, so how do, we, how do we begin to look at our limitations a little differently. I just want to give you a couple of thoughts looking at, at Paul's situation here. Um, first thing I would say is that limitations can, can free us from our expectations. Because there's nothing like running into something that you can't do to suddenly become aware of, oh, I guess I had an expectation here of what I could do that uh, suddenly, suddenly now I, I see an expectation that I didn't even know was there. Uh, Paul, I think, had some expectations of what it would be like when he got to Rome. You know, he had actually written to the Roman church before he ever went there. And he had told them this. He said, I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I may have a harvest among you, just as I had among the other Gentiles. So in his mind, when he got there, it was going to go much the same as it had other places. That's just what his expectation had been, and I think it's really easy to be thinking that um, life's going to unfold a certain way, and and uh, and then and then these things come along, and we began to realize um, as we're wrestling with the limitation, what we had in mind. Um, Johnny Erickson Tata, you know, has now been in a wheelchair for 50 years, I think, and she said something really interesting in an interview with the BBC. She said. My wheelchair is not my cross to bear daily. My cross to bear is my attitude about my wheelchair. I'm not going to let this disability scream for my undivided attention. Um, and to be able to, to go, uh, I need to let go of what I thought things were going to be. A, a limitation can force us to sit with that uh, a little more and to go, okay, where have I been assuming I was limitless. Where, where have I uh, really been counting on this one thing that I thought was going to happen that was gonna make life bearable? Where, uh, what was the impact that I thought I was gonna be able to have? And then suddenly go, oh, I, I can't. 
uh, and to go, um, what, if, what if this thing that I really wanted taken away, God just leaves? That's, that was Paul's experience with that thorn in the flesh of just going, God saying, nope, we're going to just leave that there and show you that that's not the thing that you need removed. And Paul, Paul as he stayed in prison, uh, he found that uh, actually he could, he could embrace the limitation and, and saw that God was actually at work in it. And so while he was in prison in Rome, he wrote to the Philippian church and he told them, he said, now I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. So Paul was able to pivot and go, okay, if I switch up my expectations and go, really, I've got a, I've got a built-in audience here. I've got a guard here every day that can't, can't help but listen to me talk. And that guard rotates around, and so pretty soon the whole guard hears the gospel because of, of that. And that would go on um, to the rest of Caesar's household as well. Any, any thoughts about limitations freeing us from expectations that come to mind? Thinking about how they provided safety for him. Hmm. They, like this, uh, this government appointed uh, guard was also guarding him from being uh, out of the city, yes. from being stoned, from being killed. Yes. And in a way, it was like a, provided him like a safe haven. That's, that is really interesting to go, yeah, this, this limitation that was keeping him from being out there in the world also was uh, God's protection for him. Yeah, That's he absolutely true. He been a month in Rome on his own. Yeah. He, he sat there for a couple of years and was able to do this work in a, in a, in a way. Yes, yes. Yeah, go on. Yeah, like even if limitations seem hard, they actually work in the opposite way. Of yes, right. Like yes. I, I my limitations thank the Lord I'm learning that they're fine. Like, yeah. Anyway. Right. <laughs> right. No, exactly. It it remind it it yeah, it shifts shifts our expectations of ourselves and, and lets us um let let God be be God in the situation rather than us. I think uh, limits also free us to be creative. Um, I, I watched a, a story this week about an artist by the name of Phil Hansen, uh, who, while he was in art school, he, he really um, became very much uh, passionate about a style of art known as pointillism, which is when you're, you're painting a big picture with just little dots. And so you really can't see the full thing. It's usually done on a big scale because uh, you, you can't see what you're painting unless you step away from it. Well, he really, really got into this to the point where he did nerve damage to his hand and developed a tremor and could not continue to do that kind of art. Uh, and he ended up quitting art school and uh, went to see a neurologist, and the neurologist said, yeah, you've done some permanent nerve damage there to your hand. And the, the doctor said to him, uh, why don't you learn to embrace the shake? And he thought about that, and he went home, and you know, he couldn't, he couldn't draw a straight line, so he just began to let his, his hand shake across the page and draw these scribbles and and then he began to incorporate the scribbles into uh, larger drawings and actually created uh, an art style that that used the scribble to great uh, effect and and he, and that inspired him so much that he began to think about that on a larger scale and go how can I introduce other limitations into the way I'm doing my art that can, that can also expand and, and give me more creative room. So he's like, well, what if I limited the supplies that I could use in an art project and couldn't spend more than a dollar on my supplies? And so he was like, okay, uh, I'll, I'll ask Starbucks for 50 free cups. And so he ended up 
drawing this picture on the side of 50 Starbucks cups. And, uh, and, and so just began to go, okay, what, what are more ways that these limitations can actually help to be creative? And I think that is really true. When you find you can't do certain things, um, it forces you to think in different ways. One of my favorite quotes of all time is from Eric Hoffer, who said, the most gifted of the human species are at their creative best when they cannot have their own way. <laughs> and I really like to remember that um, because when I don't get my own way, then I'd like to put myself in the most gifted of human species. <laughs> and so so I, I try to think my creative best with that. But, um, but I, I think that's really true. And we see for Paul, Paul wrote letters while he was in Rome. Uh, he couldn't go out and preach, so he began to write. And he wrote some of his most significant letters there. And depending on how you calculate or, or what, where you place timing of things, it could have been even uh, additional three letters here. But, but all these massive works that he wrote that are so pivotal in the life of the church today... You go, if he were just out constantly able to be going to every place that he wanted to go to, he might not have stopped long enough to actually write these letters that are so important for us today. And you go, the limitation ended up uh, creating more room to be creative for him. Uh, have, you, have you found that to be true in any way for you where a limitation, yeah, Rachel, Hmm. And this meal planning is kind of the bane of my existence, but I think part of it is that at the beginning of the week, I feel like, well, I don't know what I want to make. There's a whole grocery store. There's too many options. I go shopping, yeah. I buy the same things, and I don't know what I'm going to do with them. But I just bring them home. And I feel like I tend to make better meals just by opening my fridge and noticing what's in there. Huh. And yes. then making something out of what I have versus planning things in advance uh, because there's too many options. Yes, I yes. I prefer going from the scraps that I have yes. than going to the store and like grabbing this huge expanse of things. That's a really, really great <laughs> example. And uh, oh, and this better not be about your mom's meal planning, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one is about like, if I don't have the right Lego piece, I'm going to add to my Legos. Mm -hmm. I have to improvise and make some Yes. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah, yeah, we can we can use. Um, yeah, it's just I think that's just a testimony to to God's creativity uh, that that He has wired us that way. That the more limited we are, um, He it, it just opens up more things. Can I mm hmm Mm. Whatever. Uh, perfectionism, idealism, like all of a sudden I had a hard stop. I still have a hard stop. My own business straight. Wow, I wouldn't trade this for anything. Mm. Meditation has brought me more freedom. Mm. And it's also been super meaningful and terrible. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, yep. I'm still praying that the Lord will somehow that one day will straighten out. Yeah. Anyway. Well, that, that is a good word. That's a good testimony. Thank you for that. Well, one other thing that I think uh, limitations free us to do is they, they free us up to receive more. Um, if you read about Paul, it says that for two whole years, Paul stayed there. He's, this is where he's, he's stuck in one spot in his own rented house, and he welcomed all who came to see him. Now, word welcomed really means received, but what it really means is to give access to oneself. And you think about the ways in which uh, your limitations actually give people more access to you. Uh, you think about the ways that people connect to you more through your struggles than they do through your successes, right? That's where we identify, that's where we relate. That's, so when we're vulnerable and can can embrace and own our limitations, that's when we also find that we can, we can uh, welcome other people into our lives 
more. Uh, we were talking about prayer this week in Alpha. And one of the people in the video was talking about how, you know, we can have in mind that when we go to prayer, we've got to be in the right mindset. We've got to have our heart all aligned and have our attitude be super worshipful and all those things. And that a lot of times will prevent us from entering into prayer. And he said, actually, when you're feeling all the negative stuff, that's, that's the perfect time to pray because then you just take exactly what's going on with you and you offer it to God and say, God, I'm, I'm dealing with this right now. And then all of a sudden that, that takes it and it, it, uh, it lets you receive more in prayer from God because you're just um, starting right from where you are. Anne Lamott has a great uh, quote about this. She says, if you say to God, I'm exhausted and depressed beyond words, and I don't like you at all right now, and I recoil from most people who believe in you, that might be the most honest thing you've ever said. If you told me you had said to God, it's all hopeless, and I don't really have a clue if you exist, but I could use a hand, it would almost bring tears to my eyes for the courage it takes to get real, really real. I, it would make me want to sit next to you at dinner. <laughs> and, and there's something in that, isn't it? Where, where if somebody can be honest about their limitation, limitation of faith, limitation of, um, you know, where they're at emotionally, mentally, like it, it makes them so much more approachable to, to us. It makes us feel connected and related. We want to sit next to them at dinner. Um, I also think it goes the other way where when we uh, are able to acknowledge our own limitations and, and to accept them better, then we're able to receive other people with their limitations. Because I don't know about you, but for me, most of the time, if something really is bugging me about somebody else, it's probably something that reminds me of myself. Something that I see in them that I don't really, I haven't really come to terms with yet about myself. And so um, the, more, the more I come to grips with my own limits, the more I can receive other people in that way too. Any, any thoughts on, on that from anybody that we maybe haven't heard from yet? just occurs to me as much as our culture glorifies and assumes we're all striving for independence and self-sufficiency, when they test people, they find our empathy falls off very quickly for other people. We become very hardened toward other people, the more self-sufficient we feel. Mm -hmm. And that just causes us to separate and break apart and be less, uh, less soft and welcoming uh, to, to especially the, the, the more needy folks around us. Yeah. And so, well, everything tells me my goal in life should be independence. My goal in life should be self-sufficiency. I don't find that in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really good word. Um, yeah, Carmen. I just was to piggyback on that and, and the pieces about... Um, being spacious for other people, it's so easy to weaponize this concept, mm. I think, of, mm. well, it's all going to work out for good, and, um, you know, just trust God, and He's in control, and to slap true things on that don't meet mm. someone where they're at in their suffering, what if they're not safe, Paul mm. was, had a measure of safety, um, the, if they're in fight, flight, freeze, all, all the... How do we meet people there? I have such a desire to fix huh. and to man. It takes a great deal of self-management to mm. not want to fix someone because we're uncomfortable with our own limitations yes. and other people's limitations. Yeah. yeah, it's really hard to to uh, to not slip into fix-it mode. Yeah. Oh, and you get the last word here on this one. Yes. Yes. That's a good example. Yes. It happens all the time. 
Only with your sister, though, not with, not with you. Yeah. Well, I think, I think the thing is that the gospel thrives under limits. And, and this, is, this is why I'm so glad that Acts ends the way that it does. With Paul here, apparently under this great restriction. And yet the gospel is so free. There, there is nothing about this that is inhibiting the gospel. And that's because this is, this is where our gospel starts. Right? It is, it is God compressing his infinite self, uh, reducing and, and restricting his power and his glory from containing the whole universe down into living inside a human body. The, the gospel is God placing boundaries around himself on our behalf. Um, the gospel is is the word of God becoming a wordless baby. The gospel is Jesus immobilized on the cross. Uh, the gospel is the Savior confined in a dark tomb. The, the good news of the kingdom of God is, is rooted in limitation. And... I think two things come out of that for us. One is that Jesus really understands limits. Uh, if, if anybody was ever limited, it was, it was Christ in his earthly existence. No limit you are coming up against is, is beyond his understanding and empathy. And so... If you're frustrated with it, if you are, are agonizing over it, take it to Christ because there is nobody else who can more thoroughly understand your situation than him. He, he gets it on a level that we'll, we'll never be able to surpass that. And the second thing is there's no limit uh, that is more powerful than the gospel. There is, there is nothing that is too much of a limitation for the gospel being able to be effective. You look down through history, every attempt ever made to suppress or eradicate the gospel has ended up only serving to advance it. Uh, you want to you wanna slow it down by arresting the the prime spokesperson of Paul and, and putting him on trial and you end up putting him in the very hub of the known world and giving the gospel avenue to travel everywhere. You, you clip Paul's wings so he can't go out and, and preach everywhere and he ends up writing his most significant works ever. Uh, there's, there's just... Um, there's just no way that you can contain or suppress the gospel power. And so as you are, are up against whatever house arrest you're dealing with right now, and it's, it may be serious, it may be a really severe limitation that's curtailing you in a lot of ways, uh, offer, it, offer it to the Lord uh, and ask him, to meet you in it, to show you uh, new things you can expect in it, to give you new creativity for it, uh, and, and to show you more that he has to offer you and, and how you can begin to receive it in it. Let's pray. God, uh, I do thank you for the gift of limits that often most of the time does not feel like a gift because we've got an idea in our heads a dream of what we'd like to do what we hoped life would be like um, and that's really hard that that is a loss to absorb um, and God I know that there are a lot of limitations being felt in this room right now on, on so many different levels. Um, and they're not easily dismissed. It's not uh, 
like Karin was saying, we can't just say, well, God's in control and, and it's going to be okay, because sometimes it, it doesn't feel okay. Um, but God, I, I thank you that that you too understand limitations and you, you don't come alongside us without having deeply felt um, the pain and the suffering and the agony that the cross involved. And so God, um, walk alongside us as we bear our own crosses and, um, and we just pray that you would show us more of yourself uh, in our limitations. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.